just want to introduce Robin, who's the lead researcher at um, the Beckley Foundation Imperial Research Program, which um, I set up with Dave, well, that was in 2009, but initially I persuaded David that we need to work together to, defy, to discover what underlies these incredible compounds so that we can use them more um, successfully. And we started that in Bristol in 2006, and then now uh, that's developed into this, and since then, Robin has done some wonderful work <coughs> in psilocybin, MDMA, and now finally LSD, so that's a great breakthrough. First of all, thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to speak, and Amanda for enabling me to, to be here. Um, so I'm very excited to talk to you. I want to uh, try and get everything in because I've got too much, so this is going to be a, a pacey talk, but as Amanda said, uh, with the Imperial Beckley collaboration, we've done uh, brain imaging research with uh, at least work that I've, I've worked on, three different compounds, psilocybin, we've done a lot of work on, MDMA also, and most recently LSD, which is really nice. This is going to be the first time that I can present some data, brain imaging data on, on LSD to people. And it's also the first um, whole brain uh, uh, brain imaging LSD study that's, that's um, been done. So I'll talk, for, uh, talk first of all about the subjective effects, just to give you an overview and to give you a sense of what we can we're talking about when we try and make a mapping between the f phenomenology or the subjective effects of these different drugs and also their effects in the brain. So you won't be able to read this, so I'll read it to you. This is um, one of our first studies looking at the effects of psilocybin on brain activity using bold fMRI. Uh, individuals had their eyes closed during this experience. It was 15 healthy volunteers. Uh, so I'll read these. I saw geometric patterns. These are the top seven rated items of 29 different items. I saw geometric patterns, I experienced unusual bodily sensations, my imagination was extremely vivid, things looked strange, time was dis my sense of time was distorted, sounds influenced things I saw, and the experience had a dreamlike quality. This comes up a lot. Now let, let's look at the um, effects of psilocybin measured with MEG this time. This is a lot like EEG, which um, uh, Eduardo uh, talked about so nicely. Uh, so I'll read these items. I saw movement in things that weren't actually moving. Things looked strange again. I felt unusual bodily sensations. Edges appeared warped. They have their eyes open in this this uh, this uh, study. In the fMRI one, they had their eyes closed. I saw geometric patterns. My sense of size or space was distorted. And my sense of time was distorted. This comes up a lot. Now let's talk about MDMA. I'll just go over these very briefly. These are, again, the top seven items of 29 different items that are rated. I felt amazing is at the top there. I felt an inner warmth. I felt unusual bodily sensations. My sense of time was distorted again. Uh, I felt energized and enthusiastic. I felt a profound inner peace, and I felt loved up. Uh, OK, so now we've got LSD in the bottom right here. My animation's different on a Mac. Mac's always three <laughs> things for me. But uh, I made this on a PC. So anyway, let's talk about the LSD subjective effects. At right at the top there, you have my imagination was extremely vivid. The second one, the experience had a dreamlike quality. I'm going to talk about that and, uh, right at the end and, and what it means in terms of brain activity. Sounds influenced things I saw. I felt unusual bodily sensation. That always comes up. My thoughts wandered freely. Um, my perception of time was distorted. And again, I saw geometric patterns. So the point of showing all this is to really make a comparison between these classic psychedelics, psilocybin and LSD, and how their effects are different to MDMA. So MDMA, these, these top items are all really around positive mood. It's quite reliable, very reliable in, in producing positive mood effects, whereas the classic psychedelics are about perception and consciousness, a fundamental change in consciousness. For me, that's the reason why I think they're so interesting and uh, why I want to know how, how the heck <laughs> they work in the brain. Okay, so let's have a look at some brain imaging results uh, for psilocybin and MDMA. So these are using the same imaging modality, arterial spin labeling, and this gives you a measure of blood flow in the brain. On a very simple and general level, blood flow is a proxy of brain activity. So if you see a decrease in blood flow, you can make an assumption that's more or less reliable that you're having a decrease in brain activity. You can see with psilocybin, the effects are in different regions to those uh, where we see effects with MDMA. With psilocybin, they're in the cortex, and particularly in important hub structures in the cortex, like the posterior cingulate cortex. So there's a lot of uh, evidence that this region uh, is important in the modulation and mediation of conscious states. So it's interesting that we see 
a change in brain activity in this region. And we have volunteers describing their experiences in, in, in ways such as there was a definite sense of lubrication, of freedom, of the cogs being loosened and firing off in all sorts of unexpected directions. So let's compare that to MDMA, uh, where we see changes in a, a brain structures that are related to, uh, uh, well, these, these structures are hyperactive in states of anxiety and anger and ag aggression, include the amygdala. Um, so these medial temporal structures are hyperactive in anxiety states, and we see a marked decrease in blood flow in these regions with MDMA, which may explain some of the positive mood effects of this drug. Uh, and we have volunteers saying things such as, I felt floaty and warm. I gradually felt happier and happier and actually had a grin on my face. I felt secure and happy within myself. So we, uh, you can see that there's quite a, a stark difference in their effects on, on um, subjective experience. Psilocybin being about consciousness and changing activity in these cortical hub structures and also in a subcortical hub structure, the thalamus, whereas MDMA is more about targeting these regions related to mood. Um, so that gives you a sense of how these drugs differ. Now I'm going to focus on classics because, of course, ayahuasca and DMT is a, a classic psychedelic, and um, also I think they're the most interesting. So here's our um, most recent research on LSD. Now we really owe um, a huge amount of gratitude to Amanda for allowing this work to happen, and for Eduardo, who spoke just before me, for actually running the analysis. So we're lucky enough to have him in uh, at Imperial at the moment. So he did uh, the vast majority of this work, about 99% of these analyses, and did a great job on them. So let's have a look at these, these results, and I'll explain what they mean. You can see a range of different brain networks here. This is how we're starting to think about brain activity, much more in a, in a sense of um, thinking about brain networks rather than blobs in the brain, rather than regions in the brain. We're thinking about networks and their dynamics, so, so the way activity changes over time. So we're moving away from this, this uh, very limited uh, uh, phrenology-like approach to the brain and, and much more thinking about uh, making mappings between dynamic activity in brain networks and phenomenology. It's a much more uh, valid uh, um, uh, approach, I think, to making this mapping between brain activity and phenomenology. You can see in orange and red here, these are the underlying brain networks. I'm showing 15, 15 of 21 that we looked at. I'm showing the ones where there were significant effects. And what you can see are these blue patches. So blue are regions where activity has um, is less correlated to the, the underlying network uh, under LSD than placebo. So you can very, really directly interpret this as a fragmentation or a disintegration of these brain networks under LSD. You can see that visual networks are well represented. For example, look at this one in the middle on the top. I mean, these, ch these decreases in, in, in connectivity or coupling to the underlying template are almost entirely localized to that network. So I think this is really important. I mean, what we're seeing here is a disintegration of these brain networks, seeing it in a range of brain networks, visual, uh, but also high-level networks like the default mode network you heard about yesterday. Um, this seems to be particularly important in terms of the effects of classic psychedelics on, on, on consciousness. It includes regions such as the posterior cingulate cortex, which I will talk about now. This is just showing the, you the underlying activity. The top trace there shows uh, traces from two different regions and how the activity is correlated. This is the way that we find these templates. We see that activity is correlated. And here's an example of where the activity becomes decorrelated. That's what we're seeing here with the blue. Okay, so let's move on to uh, a finding which um, I'm particularly fond of because it's, it's, it's moving towards making this mapping between the subjective experience of psychedelics and the effects in the brain. So uh, you're seeing here the posterior cingulate cortex, and this is a result from our MEG uh, analyses. We're seeing a desynchrony in the posterior cingulate cortex correlating with these ratings of ego disintegration. So that the more people describe uh, or rate um, having experienced ego disintegration under psilocybin, the more desynchronous or disorganized, the more chaotic the activity in this posterior cingulate cortex region. Extremely strong correlation. Uh, and we have volunteers saying things like, that was real ego st death stuff. I only existed as a concept or as an idea. Now I want to put this in the context of a um, something described as, as entropy, which is really a a measure of something. It's a measure of disorder and also our un uncertainty about a phenomenon. And you can see here, it's quite a nice image because it shows this sort of 
dispersion of, of the particles, I suppose, that would otherwise make up this word entropy. If there's order in this system, all these particles would be constrained, restricted to, to the word. But when entropy increases, they disperse. And this is a good sort of um, illustration of what entropy is, entropy increasing. And now this is important because it's, it's very similar to what's happening when we see these fragmentations in brain networks that are ordinarily highly organized. They develop through maturation, become more organized. What we see with psychedelics is a kind of reversal of that. You can think of it as a kind of regression. And that's why there are certain aspects of the phenomenolo phenomenology of the psychedelic experience that are similar to perhaps to, to consciousness in infants, in children. You might find that a challenging idea, but I, I don't think really you should you know there's by romanticizing sometimes the the psychedelic experience we can have biases that um that sort of prevent us from really understanding what's going on we should do away with those biases in order to really understand how these drugs are working so this entropic aspect of how psychedelics work on the brain this disintegration this fragmentation is only one part of the picture one another part that i would say is probably you know, at the heart of why people value psychedelics so much is this idea around consciousness expansion, that by having disintegration in certain systems that are usually highly organized, you also allow the brain to, to operate with more freedom, with more flexibility. These are measures where we've looked at that kind of thing and found increases, for example, in the way that different regions in the brain talk to each other, different connectivity motifs that form over, over time, and also how different brain networks that are usually discrete because they need to be, because they have discrete functions. You need a visual system for doing visual processing, an auditory system for doing auditory pr processing. But what we see under psilocybin is that the difference between these networks is less. And that speaks again to this increase in flexibility in the brain, the liberated brain. So you have an entropic brain, but also a liberated brain. Now I'm going to end by talking about dreaming and the relationship between uh, psychedelics, their phenomenology, and also their action in the brain and the phenomenology of dreaming and also what we see in the brain when people experience dreaming. So this is going right to the source. This is Albert uh, talking about uh, his experience with LSD. I don't want to read all of this because I'm, s I'm uh, against time here, but he's, he, he makes this point that in a dreamlike state, with eyes closed, I perceived an uninterrupted un stream of fantastic pictures and such likes, but the emphasis is on dreamlike there. This is the first English language publication on LSD, and it, it speaks to why, personally, I, I find psychedelics so interesting. It's not really just simply about this fragmentation, this, this entropic principle. It's about what emerges. You know, psychedelic means mind manifesting, so there's something to be, to be um, discovered you know, about the mind uh, and about the brain with psychedelics. And for me, that's really at the heart of why I think they're interesting. So in this first publication in English, uh, in English um, the author said, the effect of LSD was to disturb the barrier of repression, to permit a re-examination of significant experiences from the past, which were sometimes relived with a frightening realism. I mean, for me personally, with a background in psychology and particularly psychoanalysis, th this, is, this is gold dust, you know. This is um, really, for me, why they're so interesting. So I'll read another one from a classic uh, a book on, on psychedelics, uh, Grinspoon and Bacala. And uh, here it's saying that there are good reasons for applying the term onerogenic, or pr which means producing dreams to psychedelics. In its imagery, emotional tone, and vagaries of thought, the drug trip, especially with eyes closed, and this is important, I think, resembles no other state as much as a dream. The last one here uh, is from our own LSD research, and this volunteer is saying, yes, we, are, we asked them, was it dreamlike? They said, yes, uh, very dreamlike. I was in a dream world. I was in spaces other than where I really was. With a dream, everything is untidy. It doesn't need to be structured. And this was very unstructured, very free, speaking to both the entropic principle and also the liberated brain principle. Just wanderings. Literally, sometimes I felt I was wandering. Now, this came up from a, an amazing film that I watched for the first time yesterday. I think it's called Sacred Science, but I was quite blown away by a lot of it, actually. And one of the patients who was being, um, who, who was actually suffering from cancer and actually unfortunately passed away, um, said something really beautiful, I thought, about uh, his experience. He said that, I felt like I was being read. This might not be entirely accurate, but this is what I, I remember. I felt like I was being opened up, up like a book. You know, I thought that was beautiful, because it, again, it speaks to really the, the heart of why psychedelics are so interesting for me. So I've got the penultimate slide here, uh, um, just to finish off. This is 
making the point that if you give LSD just before sleep or during sleep, you promote dream sleep. You promote rapid eye movement sleep, which is the sleep stage associated, closely associated with dreaming. So LSD is dream promoting during sleep. Also, we know that during dream sleep, uh, emotion centers, these limbic regions, these medial temporal lobe structures are um, activated in dream sleep. Now, a recent analysis that we did with Silas Ivan looked at the, um, essentially the amplitude in the signal in the whole of the brain, and we found that uh, there were increases in the amplitude of the signal in these medial temporal lobe structures under psilocybin. So for me, this spoke again to this principle that the brain under psychedelics shares similarities to what we see in the brain during dream sleep. So we both, uh, David and I wrote a, a, a brief review about this with the title, uh, Was It a Vision or a Waking Dream from Keats? And there was a nice correlation between um, individuals' uh, ratings of the dreamlike quality of their experience under psilocybin and the increase in activity and the amplitude of the fluctuations in the, in the signal in the medial temporal lobe structures. So again, making this mapping between a specific aspect of the phenomenology of uh, the psilocybin experience and, uh, and changes in brain activity. Now, interestingly and importantly, if you a actually directly target the medial temporal lobe structures and stimulate them. This was shown famously by Wilder Penfield. People describe these, these dream-like experiences. They describe uh, uh, intense emotion, visions, um, and these are the terms that they use. They say, I was dreaming, you know. And most recently, uh, looking for the focus of, of an epilepsy, uh, some researchers in the States stimulated the hippocampal region, and uh, individuals described, um, again, dream-like sequences. They, they also describe uh, faces melting, you know, which is, which is incredibly psychedelic. So just to end now with the summary of what I've talked about, that there's network disintegration. This speaks to the entropic principle of uh, the action of psychedelics on the brain, but there's also a range, an increase in the range or repertoire of states. So this speaks to the liberated and the flexibility aspect of how the brain changes with psychedelics. And also that the brain uh, looks similar in some respects, has some similarities uh, to the brain. Um, the brain in the psychedelic state has similarities to the brain in dream sleep. And this is something that we'll um, openly look at again, this time with the prior hypothesis um, about uh, uh, in the context of our LSD data. Now all of this may be due to the constraining and inhibitory function of uh, of, um, of hub structures in the brain that are have particularly dense concentration of the serotonin receptors that um, are targeted by psychedelics. So if you want, if, if there's one message to take home from this talk about a metaphor or a principle of how psychedelics seem to work in the brain, it would be that there's a disintegration and a liberation, disintegrate and liberate, that there's chaos above in the cortical regions, but anarchy below in these uh, regions related to memory and emotion, uh, as there is in dreaming. Finally, just to uh, thank the big hitters that have really made this possible. And truly, this, this just wouldn't have happened without uh, David Nutt and Amanda Fielding, director of the Beckley Foundation. So we owe a, a huge amount of gratitude to them for, to, for really... <laughs> and uh, Amanda has really been, you know, an initiating uh, researcher in, in this field is really allowing us now to look at this, uh, th these, these drugs um, and take a new, new direction in our, in our look at, uh, at these drugs. So these are the ground troops. Um, one of them is in the audience here, <laughs> Luke Williams, and uh, Tim Williams, psychiatrist. We've got a couple of psychiatrists. In fact, we've got three that, that supervise the sessions. This is us on our final day of the LSD study. It's now complete, thank goodness. It was a lot of fun, but it's great to have it finished. Uh, drinking champagne out of plastic cups. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.